Welcome back, everybody. Um, for those of you who just came in the last few minutes, you might not know that the music that was being played while we were out having coffee was Lou Reed's Take a Walk on the Wild Side, which struck me as the only scientific meeting I'd ever been to where that actually happened. You know, before the break, we heard two really interesting, different points of view about barley. One, Flavio's, was about you know, the international picture in terms of increasing yield and uh, varieties. And then Thava's was more on take barley, but do something different with it, develop it into different marketable products. And we're about to hear a similar sort of story that is taking something familiar and turning it into something different and hopefully profitable. Uh, this time, though, the familiar is canola which I, uh, having been a city guy all my life, argue that urban Albertans, it's the only crop they can recognize. Uh, but the yellow, the famous yellow of canola, is really just a superficial aspect of the crop. There's much more to it than that. And uh, To hear about some of those possibilities, please welcome Jonathan Curtis. He's a professor in the lipid chemistry group at the, by now, very well-known Ailes at UVA. Jonathan. Well, I'm going to go ahead. Thank you for that nice introduction and for the um, invitation to speak here, which is a great honor. I'm going to wander around here, I think. So you may be wondering why I have such a crazy title. And this came about because I had the good fortune to be on holiday in the Bahamas uh, earlier this year when I received a somewhat nagging email from Alberta Innovates Biosolutions as to why I hadn't given them a title for my talk. And uh, so my talk is, is generally going to be about converting uh, oils that we can grow in Alberta into materials and chemicals. And so on the day I received this email, I visited a place called the Garden of the Groves on Grand Bahama Island, which I thoroughly recommend. And there they have this labyrinth. So let's, let's go inside the labyrinth and see where we get to. Well, the first thing you'll find out is what is a labyrinth? And um, labyrinths are found in many cultures around the world, perhaps most famously in some cathedrals in Northern Europe, where they were the paths that some pilgrims took that allowed them time to meditate as they meandered towards the center of the, of the um, labyrinth. Um, here's me in the center of the labyrinth, having, take, having taken my path. And although the amazing thing about a labyrinth is that although it doesn't seem very far from the outside to the middle of the labyrinth, it probably took about 20 minutes to walk this whole path. And it struck me that on that day that that was a fantastic analogy for applied research because there we are on the outside we can see where we want to be in the middle in in the case of this talk we want to convert some of these oil products that we have in abundance into new materials and chemicals that give added value and benefit so i could see the center of the labyrinth but as i get there i have to take these counterintuitive turns in the wrong direction, often moving away from the center in order to get to where I want to go. So let's start with our labyrinth idea. And we have uh, canola oil that comes from these yellow fields that Jay introduced, turns this into this lovely yellow oil that we use for cooking. So here in Alberta, we grow a lot of canola. We grow about a third of the Canadian crop. Canada produces 30% of the world's production of canola. It's worth many billions of dollars to our province. But here's the problem. This uh, data, which came from the Canola Council, shows the economic impact. And most of this economic impact is this green bar, which is the farming portion. What I'm talking about today is this little pink part, which is the end uses, that value-added products that we could get from canola, and the, the problem that we have today is that's very small. So my talk is about how do we improve that? Well, the way we improve that is through something called oleochemistry. So oleochemicals are something that you probably don't know that you're so familiar with, but they're everywhere in, in your everyday life. So for example, most um, soaps and detergents, many cosmetic products, these are oleochemicals. They're these are things that have been made by taking the oil crops 
on the left um, and converting them into some of these products on the right, paints and coatings. Many of them contain oily, uh, oils. But most oleochemicals are made from either palm oil, which is the most widely produced oil in the world, or soya oil, which is the second most. What I want to talk today is about canola oil and perhaps some other less well-known oils. And canola is the third most produced uh, oil in the world. The first project I want to talk about is how we can convert canola into a chemical which can eventually become foam insulation for your house or for an industrial building. So polyurethane spray foam insulation, um, which you've probably come across, um, has about double the insulation value, double the R value of fiberglass, which is the most commonly used insulation material. So it's a great product. But in addition, it's a vapor barrier. It doesn't sag like fiberglass does. If you've ever renovated an old house, you'll know that the fiberglass ends up at the bottom of the wall. Um, and so there's a lot of advantages. So it can result in energy efficiency. Um, and if we could make that somewhat bio-based, there's more advantages still. So the way you, you make uh, polyurethane is by blending two components, one of which is called compound A, which is a chemical we're not going to talk about called isocyanate, and the other is compound B, and these come in separate drums. And compound B is a complex mixture of chemicals, but the majority of it is something called a polyol. So just remember that word polyol. What we want to do is we want to take the petrochemical polyol out of it and turn it into an oleochemical polyol, which would be made from canola. So in the spray foam process, these two streams pass through separate tubes that you can see here. They come up to a heated nozzle, and they're sprayed out with a pressure of gas. Um, and at the bottom photograph here, you can see a demonstration facility where we've been testing these uh, foams. And what has to happen is this foam has to hit the wall, but it has to almost immediately expand into foam, because right now it's two jets of uh, separate chemicals. As it expands into foam, it has to cure, it has to reach the right density, it has to stick to the walls, and it mustn't run down the walls. It's a very complicated technical process that's required to achieve all those things. So, so just to, to go back to that word polyol, which is this uh, oleochemical that we've been making, for a number of years we've been working on the development of these polyol compounds, um, and we, uh, this, we went through a number of, of processes, largely funded by our friends at ACIDF, and that resulted in a patent which has been granted and we now have a company in Vancouver who is making small production scale uh, lots of this uh, polyol. It's been through seven ge several generations since, but that's another story for another time. So we took our biopolyol that we've developed through this chemistry, um, and we tried to make it into foam, and the result was biofoam, and biofoam is going to become a commercial product. So, uh, I don't want to go in too much detail in it, but biofoam has to meet all the same uh, performance criteria that any kind of spray foam would meet. So it has to have that fast uh, rising time. It has to become a foam quickly. It has to cure quickly. It has to have the moisture uh, barrier that, that you need. It reaches the right density to get the right um, R value at the end of the day and the right strength and so on and so on. And to cut a long story short, we've, uh, we've managed to achieve that. So that's great. So here we are, back to our labyrinth. We're, we've started with this concept. We've come up with a process. We, we have chemistry happening. And we can turn that into a formulation which becomes biofoam. So that's great. We're, we're going in and we're starting to move towards the, straight towards the center of the labyrinth. So all's looking good. Well, one example of how we could use this foam is, uh, is given here. And one of the companies we're working with is called Mod Panel. It's here in Edmonton. And on the right, you can see a picture of the arena being built a few blocks away from here. And the roof panels of the arena are these mod panels, which are prefabricated roofing panels that already incorporate 
uh, spray foam insulation. We want these to be our canola-based uh, biofoam, and so as we move forward, this will become a reality. Um, now, an important aspect of all this, it's not just good enough to just make a bio substitute for um, an existing product. It's also important to consider the overall life cycle uh, environmental impact of that. And that, this is what we uh, looked at with our partners at Green Analytics, who I believe have already spoken at this uh, event in previous years, um, with our CCMC uh, funding. And to cut a long story short, this graph shows all of the calculations of the uh, greenhouse gas uh, life cycle emissions. And we found that um, the climate change impact for the bio-based spray foam was about 20% lower than for petrochemical spray foam. Now this makes all kinds of assumptions about where it comes from, how much is shipped around, how much we use, and this is probably an upper value. We may end up with only 10%, but nevertheless, over the life cycle of this, it's a significant saving. But as with our labyrinth, there are all kinds of twists and turns, and we may have to move backwards sometimes. So here's just an example, and I finally got to have a uh, chemical structure, and I'm a chemist, I can't really give a talk without a structure sooner or later. So uh, this just shows you the details aren't very important, but what this shows is that in considering the, in, the overall environmental impact, we also have to consider that we, there's no point making this product if it's not used. So it has to meet all of the requirements, which are those of the current specifications. Currently, people tend to use in these spray foam uh, insulations um, a molecule that's a fluorocarbon as what's called a blowing agent. So the blowing agent ends up inside the bubbles. Um, the foam is made up of a number of closed cell bubbles all joined together. And inside those bubbles, we have this blowing agent which add to the R value of the overall uh, material. If we don't use the same blowing agents, we don't get the same R value, and so we can't compete in, on the current market. And currently, the, the one that's used, although it is no longer the fluorochlorocarbons that were once used, which are ozone-depleting chemicals, they've been eliminated. Now we have these molecules, but they still are potent greenhouse gases, and if they're released from the foam into the atmosphere, that could be a negative. So the, there are new generations of blowing agents coming along, and as we evolve this product, we will certainly incorporate them. But I just want to point out, like, you can't solve all the world's problems in one iteration, and these are one of these twists in the labyrinth that take you away from where you want to go, but that you have to take in order to reach the goal. Uh, and another aspect of is it that Green Analytics are developing uh, monitoring tools um, that allow um, a consumer who may have installed biofoam insulation in the future into their home to see what their overall energy savings would be. And so you can imagine taking um, an entire region, perhaps building new uh, houses, and seeing how moving from traditional insulation to biofoam could have an overall impact on energy savings and help you to work out carbon credits and such. So here we are, we've moved further in our labyrinth now. We've almost got to the center, but now we're sort of moving away because we're starting to see all these issues. We've got our uh, canola, becomes our plant. We've found our formulation, so things are looking good, but you know, we're not quite sure where we're going here. But there's good news on the horizon, and that good news is that globally, there's a tremendous interest in bio-based chemicals, and oleochemicals are great examples of bio-based chemicals. And um, this, this plot, that again, the numbers don't really matter, but the prediction is that there'll be a great increase over the next 10 years in the use of oils in uh, materials and chemicals, uh, starting materials. But I suspect that this plot was made, I don't know all the details of it, but I suspect this was made based on the growth of the palm oil industry and the soya industry, not on the canola industry. So that's what we need to change. So we have lots of other ideas of how we can use the oils that we can grow in Alberta to promote the use of these oleochemicals and to promote industry here. So another project that we have 
um, that's recently been funded by Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, is to work with the biocomposites group who have a locally fairly well-known uh, first um, fiber mat plant in North America um, in Drayton Valley where they can convert forestry and agricultural fibers into mats which can then be sealed with resin and made into panels for uh, cars or boards for houses or furniture or all kinds of applications that haven't been dreamed up yet. So what we want to do, what we're going to do in this project is we're going to take our bio resin technology, which is another thing we've done. It's based on old technology brought to the new century with some new ideas so we can make fully bio-based resins, combine that with bio-based fiber and make materials which, which are going to be great. And this, um, this project, uh, a collaborator on this project, um, Dr. Shari Aranansi is going to talk after me, so that will be, uh, you may hear more about these types of, of things. So another idea we had to uh, make oil more useful in other areas is that we were really interested in this oil called castor oil. So castor oil is a tropical oil. Um, it mainly comes, mine is grown in India, a few other tropical places as well can grow it. Obviously, in Alberta, where we can have snow any month of the year, as people love to say, uh, we can't grow it. But there are other crops, and one of those that we are interested in is called camelina. And we have a project with a company called Linnaeus, who are out of Vancouver, who are really interested in the production of camelina. <clears throat> now, castor oil is used in a huge range of industrial products. It's used in polymers. It's used in many um, personal care items. It's used in lubricants. It's a very big industrial uh, crop, and it's particularly useful because it contains almost one, it's almost a pure source of this molecule here, which we won't go into except to say that it is a natural kind of polyol. So we really like to be able to make something just like that using a crop we can grow here. And the, our, our goal is that if we could make this product and we have developed something called coral, which is now, um, we have a patent application on, if we could make this commercially here and capture just 5% of the castor oil market, that would be worth $100 million a year to the Alberta or the Alberta and Saskatchewan economies. And that's just for the crude oil the downstream products that could be made for it could be much more valuable. So uh, we've come a long way uh, through the labyrinth. We've, we've, started, oh, sorry. we've, we've started with uh, many, uh, we started with canola, we started with other oil crops such as hemp, which I didn't talk about, but was the source of those uh, fiber products, uh, flax. Maybe we're starting to get uh, some oleochemical industry going. And I'm happy to say that Alberta Innovates Biosolutions have recently funded the Biofoam Group to develop the um, facilities to make, uh, uh, make biofoam on a commercial scale, on a small commercial scale, and to develop plans for generating this polyol um, in, on a more meaningful scale uh, in Alberta in the future. So we're very excited about that. Um, so the oleochemical industry will gradually get developed. We'll be able to make these products. Um, there's many uh, challenges in this, but uh, as it says on the slide, if you stay on the path, you'll reach the center, and that's, that's what we believe in. Uh, this is a photograph of my group, the Lipid Chemistry Group, who have done all this work. I just stand at the top, at the front and talk, and so I'm very grateful to all of them. And I'm grateful to all of the many funders and industrial collaborators um, and in between uh, groups like the former uh, biorefining conversions network who have helped to make connections for us. And thank you for your attention. So um, I get the labyrinth uh, idea, but it seems to me there's so many critical decisions that have to be made, like what crop? But I want to go back and just ask you specifically, when you, who, how did you come up with the idea that of all the things you might uh, use canola for, it was foam insulation? 
Uh, that's a great question. And in fact, a constant problem I've had since I moved into working with materials has been, well, that's great, we can make a material, but what do we do with it? And I ask lots of people this same question, and I very rarely get a good answer because nobody really knows. I think the short answer is it turns out that the, material, the chemical we can make, the oleochemical we can make, is ideally suited to making rigid foam insulation. Um, so I think you just have to find those applications which really hit the sweet spot for, for, for what you can make. And there are many oil crops that we can look at, and so the range of products is huge. Hmm. Great. Thank you, Thank you again. You. So if you think back to the uh, genesis of the Industrial Revolution and as it developed through the 19th century, the thing that's, one of the things that strikes me is everything was on a mega scale, you know, giant coal mines, steam engines, machinery, factories. But industrial innovation these days happens at a very different uh, size scale, the ultra microscopic. So now, uh, Industrial innovation happens arranging individual atoms or working with in folding sheets that are one atom thick. It's a completely new and different world, but it has the same sorts of things driving it as the Industrial uh, Revolution did. Um, Chari Aranji is uh, working in this it's even the nano world, not the ultra microscopic. He's in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Alberta, and he's going to give us some insights into what it's like to work in this modern industrial world. Chari. Thank you, Jay. Hello. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, so my name is Chari Iranji. I don't write it that way. As you can see, it's written Kagri. Um, I was born in Ottawa, Ontario, but from the very thick accent, you can uh, imagine that uh, after five years, we went uh, uh, back to Turkey and uh, I came back uh, for my uh, master's, uh, undergrad and master's, and, and we stayed uh, still uh, since then. Uh, I'm originally from a uh, coast uh, city uh, in Turkey uh, called Antalya. It's on the Mediterranean. So just like Thawa was saying, you know, I'm coming also from uh, plus 45-ish degrees to minus 45. Uh, interesting. Uh, Antalya is the city that gives uh, both my daughters uh, their names, uh, Talia and Alanya. So uh, that's, that's a very nice uh, city if you have a chance to visit. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we came back in 99 and uh, I did my uh, undergraduate and master's at uh, University of Ottawa, I, uh, the biggest uh, bilingual university in North America. I still don't speak French, uh, but I did get married to a francophone, which I covered that basis. Uh, so af after that, uh, I came to University of Alberta to do my PhD in, in mechanical engineering department. Uh, then I went uh, to UBC. So from all the way east to west, uh, UBC, I did my uh, postdoctoral fellowship there. And then in 2012, I got hired back uh, from University of uh, Alberta as an assistant professor, uh, and I'm, I'm here since then. Um, now, uh, in general, uh, I work with uh, fibrous composite materials. Uh, I work on braided composite materials. Uh, these are uh, materials if I can get the video, please. Uh, these are, uh, braiding is a very old technique that's used for uh, textile uh, manufacturing, but of course now we are using it for advanced uh, materials. Uh, that, uh, what you see, is the production of a polymeric uh, re reinforced rebar uh, that is alternatives to steel rebars in uh, civil engineering applications. I have to say the alternative, otherwise civil engineers get very uh, upset with me. So it's an alternative uh, um, uh, rebar. Uh, on the right, that small figure that you see is we are the first group in the world uh, that showed uh, a 3D uh, braided uh, arch wire for dental applications uh, that, and, and we showed that uh, production and, and uh, tailorability of the mechanical properties. My other work is on shape memory polymers. Uh, these are polymers that can have a temporary shape and uh, that's assigned and then we can recall uh, the original uh, shape you see there in the uh, straight beam. Uh, my third area of research which I'll be talking a little bit today is, is electrospun uh, formation and characterization of electrospun nanofibers. Uh, these are very, very small fibers we'll be talking about. And additive manufacturing, uh, 3D printing uh, using FDM technique. Uh, here you see uh, two uh, very, very small miniature kayaks printed in my laboratory, again using shape memory polymers for these applications. 
Uh, now, uh, as you can see, uh, one thing uh, that is common here is uh, everything that I do uh, depends on fibers. Uh, so I'm a fiber composite guy. And uh, today what I would like to talk to you about is a, a fiber that really excites me a lot. It is actually a nanofiber. Uh, it is called cellulose nanocrystals, CNC. Um, if you go back, cellulose is the most abundant natural uh, biodegradable uh, renewable polymer in the world. And CNC, uh, cellulose nanocrystals, are basically obtained uh, from the crystalline regions of uh, these cellulose fi cellulosic fibers. Uh, they, uh, AITF here uh, in, in Alberta has uh, one of the very few pilot plants uh, in, in uh, production of CNC, and I, I feel very, very uh, uh, lucky to be able to have access to the CNC. So if you look um, uh, in, in general, CNC on the, on the left hand side, that, that white cotton looking uh, stuff is actually the CNC, the cellulose nanocrystals. Uh, when you look at it, 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 it clumps together. Uh, it looks like cotton, as I said, or cotton candy, whichever whatever you want to call it. Um, but if you actually go and take a very uh, a close look at it under the uh, microscope, scan electron microscope on the right hand side, uh, you will see that these are actually very, very small uh, nanocrystals. So, um, uh, as, as you can, the, all, all those rods that you see are, are uh, nanocrystals, uh, cellulosic nanocrystals. And just to give you an idea as to the size of these, uh, there's a chart there. You can see uh, human hair is on the right hand side, a CNC with the red on the left hand side. Human hair is approximately roughly 100,000 nanometers. The CNC is roughly 10 nanometer in diameter, so a very, very small uh, dimension. So, uh, you know, viruses, bacteria there, so CNC is very, very small. Uh, so we need to find uh, ways uh, to put this into uh, the materials. Now, why? Because CNC has very great mechanical, pro and that mechanical properties, and that's the thing that excites me as a composite material engineer, composite materials professor. Uh, it gives uh, two times the stiffness of aluminum, 10 times the strength of stainless steel. So it's a really, really great material, but very small. You can't just take a, and, and pull on it, right? So you need to be able to put it into the material and you need to be able to disperse it in the material very well. You can't let it clump or agglomerate in one portion and the other portions don't have CNC. So it is really, really important to be able to uh, put it homogeneously into the material. And this is only possible when you properly surface modify uh, the, the, the CNC and allow it to disperse within the material. And that's why I actually collaborate a lot with chemists, with chemical engineers and etc. Uh, and and uh, the projects that I'm going to be talking to you about CNC has a lot of different applications, films, ropes, uh, uh, small fibers, uh, foams, as I will be talking about. Today, I will be talking about uh, two of the uh, ap uh, applications that I'm doing uh, in, in my laboratory. This is uh, related to a project that is supported by Alberta Innovates Biosolutions, uh, and it's called Nana uh, Crystalline Cellulose uh, Reinforced Foam Core Sandwich uh, Composite Structures. Why NCC? Because when we wrote the project two and a half years ago or so, it used to be called NCC, now it's CNC, so it's the same thing. So, if you look at the uh, a sandwich structure, you have a skin layer, you have a foam core, and in between you have a uh, an, an adhesive layer. In this project, we are trying to put the CNC to reinforce uh, into the, uh, the adhesive layer. So we are trying to produce CNC reinforced electrospun adhesive layer. And we are trying to put it also into the foam core. So we are trying to make uh, CNC reinforced foam core uh, structures. Now, first, electrospinning. Let's talk a, lo a little bit about electrospinning. It is a very simple technique, very old technique. First patent is around 1904, I believe, 1912. Uh, but uh, it, it started to get uh, popularized around uh, 90s and 2000. Now, uh, it, is, it is a very, very popular technique to produce polymeric nanofibers. Uh, we have uh, qu quite a bit of parameters that we can uh, play with so that we can tailor the end properties and morphology of the uh, materials. Uh, if I can get the uh, video, please. Uh, so on the right hand side, you see uh, uh, that uh, when the video is running, uh, you will see the end product uh, when we electrospun a uh, basically randomly distributed fiber mat. Uh, you can see it's like a cloth, actually. Um, it's a randomly distributed fiber. Um, it, is, uh, it can be produced very, very quickly, uh, and it is 
fairly strong, um, depending uh, on, on, on the polymer that you're using. But of course, it becomes much, much, much stronger when you put CNC in it. And that's what we, uh, we are interested in. So that cloth-like structure, if you actually zoom in there with a, a SEM, uh, you will see these small, small, small fibers, uh, and uh, which uh, sub-micron or, or nano uh, diameters. Uh, and we are actually trying to put the NCC into, small, into those small uh, fibers to even further improve. Now, in this project, we are trying to reinforce the polystyrene with uh, NCC. And uh, so far, we actually got uh, quite good results uh, in terms of the increase in the modules of the uh, fibers. This is modulus versus modified CNC concentration. And even uh, from 0% CNC to 2% CNC, we are getting approximately nine times increase in the uh, elastic modulus, which is absolutely fantastic for us. Um, the second one, again, this time is the foam core uh, for the sandwich structure. I'm going to be talking about expanded polystyrene foams, which is EPS. Um, EPS, we are, we are actually very familiar. Whenever you buy a computer, a, a, a TV or something, uh, the, the foam that comes in it, the protective foam, is EPS. It's not on use, of course. It's, it's one of the uh, most widely used uh, foams in the world, so there's a large uh, market for it. Uh, so we take, if you look at the step one, we take the uh, EPS resin. We expand those beads uh, due to the pantene in it. Uh, it's almost like a popcorn. It pops, uh, it increases in size, sometimes 20 to 30 times. And then we basically take them and mold it into a shape. Now, what we are trying to do, if you take a cross section of that form, you will see the cellular structure. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to put CNC's into there to improve the mechanical properties, more particularly the uh, compressive uh, modulus and etc. Now, uh, we are right about here in our project right now. So the preliminary results are actually very, very encouraging. Uh, you can see the specific modules of the mo uh, uh, foam with respect to uh, CNC concentration. We have a steady increase. Uh, we are going approximately 60% increase with even 1% CNC. Of course, we still have a, a wide uh, spread in data, so we are uh, conducting more experiments, but this is very, very uh, promising. Uh, and uh, also, uh, the results are so promising that uh, there is a Calga uh, Calgary, uh, around that Calgary region, there is a big uh, EPS uh, producer. It's one of the biggest uh, EPS producers in North America. They are already very much interested in the product, so we will be talking uh, to them in terms of commercialization of this product. Um, uh, what uh, the, the, the scale of use you can imagine, uh, it's, it's, we can use it in insulating roofs, floors, walls, concrete forming applications, and structural lightweight fill or road embankment uh, construction applications. So you can see uh, if, if, if we can increase the mechanical properties, that means that we can use actually uh, lower material. Just think about the volume of these being transported from the factories to the sites. It is going to bring a great advantage uh, to uh, the industry. Uh, where are we going? We are going, uh, we are going to be uh, seeing uh, CNC to be used in many, many different uh, applications uh, down the future, biomedical devices, catheters and etc. Uh, composite ropes, textiles, we are starting a project on that. Uh, filtration uh, purposes and uh, controlled drug delivery in pharmaceutical applications. Uh, so these are all the things that we will be seeing down the road in the future. Um, and uh, before exceeding too much my time, I would like to thank, uh, first of all, my co investigators, Professor Yaman Baluk and Professor Mark McDermott from University of Alberta, uh, as well uh, the research team. Uh, I would like to acknowledge all of them, including Alberta Innovation and Technology Futures team, Dr. Behzad Ahvazi and his group, and uh, Dr. Christophe Danuma. Uh, and of course, these are all happening uh, with the funding that is provided uh, to, uh, by AI Bio to us, uh, not only to the project, but also to the uh, pilot plant, uh, plant that is uh, built in, in uh, AITF uh, under the AI uh, umbrella. Uh, just to give a very, very uh, small um, history, when I first came uh, in, in 2012, I was really dying to get my hands on, on CNC. It was a novel product. I really wanted it. And you know, you can't find it here and there. A couple of uh, research laboratories are synthesizing it. And all of a sudden, uh, I, I gave a call to AITF. Uh, and they said, OK, yeah, we'll, we'll send you uh, some. Uh, of course, I had to sign my life away with an NDA, uh, non-disclosure agreement. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I got five grams. Five grams, I was extremely happy. That was, you know, we actually published two conference papers, one journal pa uh, paper uh, from that five grams. I still have a little bit. 
just to let you know what happens with AI biofunding and AITF support and, and, and all the research going on, now I basically call uh, my contact, Dr. Behzat Afazi, who's the team lead there on CNC. I said, uh, Benji, I say, Benji, I, I need a little bit uh, CNC to, to, to finish this project. Can you send me? He said, yeah, sure. Is half a kilogram enough? You know, from five grams to half a kilogram, and, and, and this is helping us to do more and more research. This is helping us to connect to industries such as the foam industry and etc. And uh, we truly appreciate the support. Thank you. So I, I just want to pick up on the labyrinth idea that Jonathan gave us. And you gave us a, a huge variety of potential uh, uses and you showed us a graph where you say so far the results are encouraging. So at what point though do you have to jump off a horse that isn't running fast enough? Do you know what, like how do you how do you make those decisions of of all these promising leads this one we got to put our efforts in because that one isn't as promising. Um, well, I, th I think it's, it's, it's uh, what, how do you do that doing a really good literature review and understand what is capable, what, what, what can you do with this material? Now, for example, when this first came out, people were trying to put, you know, 20% of CNC into a material. And actually, there is an optimal point after, depending on the polymer, after 5%, you start decrease. So uh, I, I see my, my best results in electrospinning in, in approximately 2.5%, 3%, sometimes. So you don't want to put too much. So what is important is to create design curves for design engineers so that they know what is the best point of utilizing this, hmm. as well as if I use this much, if I get this much benefit in mechanical properties, for example, how much is that going to cost me? So I, th I think that's, that's the important thing that needs to be. And so far, CNC is, is, is a tremendous material, I think. It's, it's a, it has very good uh, uh, promise. Great. Thanks again, Charlie. Thank you. Um, we're very familiar in this province with prion diseases, like BSE, of course. In fact, the most recent case was just over a year ago. Uh, also, chronic wasting disease in deer, elk, and moose creeping northwest from the southeastern corner of the province, and of course, moving north in Saskatchewan. Not to mention the human prion diseases that we have the normal share of. It's also true, though, that uh, Alberta is known worldwide as an excellent center of prion research, and the research ranges from uh, ecological issues like chronic wasting disease all the way down to the really fundamental puzzles of prion diseases. How do bad prions convert good ones to actually multiply? And probably most important, how might we interrupt that process? Uh, Sabina Gelf is uh, at the University of Calgary. She's in actually the veterinary school there, and she is researching exactly that question, how to prevent the spread of prion diseases. Sabina. So thanks for the introduction, and thanks a lot to the organizers of this wonderful event. I really feel honored by the invitation to speak here about our research on prion diseases. And actually, I'm in that field now for a little bit more than 15 years, and I'm still fascinated by prion diseases because these diseases are really unique for two reasons. First, they are caused by an unconventional infectious pathogen that is only composed of protein. And second, they can affect humans and animals and can cause a wide variety of symptoms in those patients. So scrapie is the ancient form of prion disease of sheep and goat that has been known since the 18th century. And already at that time, it has been known that it can be transmitted from animal to animal, and shepherds were advised to isolate affected animals from the herd to prevent the spread of the disease. So the main symptom of scrapie is that the animals suffer from excessive itching, so they rub their body wherever they find the opportunity to, and this is why they start to lose their wool along the progression of the disease. Mad cow disease, or BSE, has received a lot of attention in the 1990s when the case numbers reached epidemic, epidemic dimensions in the United Kingdom, and hundreds of thousands of animals had to be culled because they developed symptoms of BSE, which are basically the animals become hypernervous, and at the end stage they lay down and cannot get up again. I guess many of you remember how the Canadian beef industry was destroyed 
basically overnight when the first Canadian case of BSE was um, diagnosed here in Alberta. In the meantime now, BSE has been managed very well, but now Alberta, Saskatchewan and many other states in the United States are struggling with chronic wasting disease in deer, moose and elk. And this disease is the only prion disease that affects both captive and wild animals. And this is where the problems come in because as scrapey, chronic wasting disease can be transmitted from deer to deer within one population. And so currently the spread cannot be controlled in wild animals. And every year we observe increasing case numbers of chronic wasting disease in Alberta deer population. Then we have human diseases with Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease being the most common one that occurs in a frequency of about one person affected per one million per year. So it's a very rare disease. But there are still other forms like genetic forms or infectiously acquired forms such as Kuru um, that has been transmitted in, a, in the forest tribe in Papua New Guinea by ritualistic cannibalism. So those people used to eat the dead bodies of their relatives as a form of worship. And actually it has been documented that they didn't like to eat Europeans because they were too fat and too salty, so they were not tasty. <laughs> So maybe the Europeans should have added more barley to their diet to become more <laughs> attractive for those people. So although we see a remarkable variety in prion diseases, all those diseases have many things in common. So first, all prion diseases are fatal and all are transmissible within the same species, between different species, and in case of BSE, uh, uh, mad cow disease prions have even jumped the species barrier from cows and infected humans and caused a new form of Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease in humans which affected mainly young people and teenagers. Prion diseases are diseases of the brain and if we look at brain slices of patients we see such holes in those brain slices through the microscope. And this is what we call spongiform neurodegeneration, and it is observed in basically all prion diseases. All prion diseases have a very long incubation time that can last from years to even decades, but once the clinical symptom starts, the patient will die very quickly within a couple of months. We also do not have any means to diagnose those diseases before the clinical symptom starts, and we also have, despite more than 30 years of research, no options to treat those diseases. And of course, all prion diseases are caused by uh, prions, which can be clearly distinguished from other infectious agents such as viruses or bacteria. So prion is an abbreviation and stands for proteinaceous infectious particle, and this tells us that prions are composed only of protein. So you may say now, okay, viruses and bacteria, they also contain protein, but the big difference is that viruses as well as bacteria use genetic information such as DNA or RNA to inherit the information for their proteins and to replicate. Prions do not have any nucleic acid, so they only have their protein component, and this is what clearly separates them from viruses and bacteria. But where does this protein come from? And this is the really fascinating thing about prions. Prions consist of a protein that is produced by our own body. And this protein can behave like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, where we have the beautiful, handsome Dr. Jekyll who can change his shape and turn into the ugly Mr. Hyde who is then doing funny things. So the Dr. Jekyll in our case is called the cellular prion protein, the normal prion protein which everybody in this room and every animal has in his brain. However, the normal prion protein has a function in the brain, it is, an, it, it's, it is soluble and it does not cause disease. However, under certain circumstances, it can also change its shape and its conformation and turn into the bad prion protein, which we call PRP scrapie. And PRP scrapie is the only component of prions, and you can see the difference here. So this is PRPC. In PRP scrapie, we have a protein that clumps together, it forms aggregates in the brain, it, it deposits in our brain cells, and it is infectious. And this process finally leads to the death of our brain cells and finally to the death of the patient. So 
if prions do not have any genetic information, how do they replicate? Actually, it's not completely understood how this really happens, but in this slide, the most important steps are, are summarized. So first, we have the two players, the good PRPC and the bad PRP scrapie, which meet in the brain of the patients. And then we know that uh, PRPC can directly bind to PRP scrapie, so they form a complex and because of this binding, PRPC is forced to adopt the pathological conformation of PRP scrapie. So they bind, PRPC changes its shape and turns into a new PRP scrapie molecules. PRP scrapie then clumps together in the brain, it forms those fibrils, they can break up into smaller subunits, and those smaller subunits again can recruit PRPC and convert new PRPC molecules into PRP scrapie. So one main goal of um, the research in my lab is to find new strategies to treat those prion diseases. And since the binding of PRPC and PRP scrapie is so important in the propagation process, we asked the question when we whether we can stop that conversion process by uh, inhibiting the binding of PRPC to PRP scrapie. So to achieve this, we've used a new class of, of molecules, which are called peptide aptamers. And all I want you to remember is that peptide aptamers are proteins that have a, ve that have a very uh, large portion that is stable and just builds a scaffold for a small, highly variable region. So they are uh, engineered towards having a wide variety of different shapes in a small stretch of the protein. So we have engineered a library that consists of about one million of uh, different peptide aptamers, and we have mixed them with the normal cellular prion protein and selected those peptide aptamers that, that uh, stably interact with PRPC, so those peptide aptamers that bind to PRPC with the idea that thereby we can inhibit the binding of the bad PRP scrapie. So to prove whether this hypothesis works, whether we can stop prion propagation with using this peptide aptamers, we are using mainly two um, experimental systems. So the first is we culture brain cells in such petri dishes, and which look like this then. And if we have those brain cells growing in the petri dishes, we can infect them with prions. So they start the, the conversion process in the petri dishes. We can infect those cells with prions, and then we can add whatever drug we want to test to the culture medium of those cells and look whether we can cure them from prion infection. And the second systems are mouse model for prion disease, so if we succeed in cell culture, we will test all our drugs in mouse models that we infect with prions. We measure the incubation times until the mice start to develop symptoms, and eventually we look at the brain slices of those mice for the extent of those holes in the brain. So for the peptide aptamers, we produced them in E. coli and purified them, and then we added them to the cultures of the prion-infected brain cells for a few days. And then we looked at whether we were able to reduce the PRP scrapie load in those cells, and actually our approach worked. So these black bands are representative for PRP scrapie, and in the control cells we have a lot. However, if we treat those cells with the peptide aptamers, we can reduce PRP scrapie, which basically means that our strategy worked. So if we add peptide aptamers to our cultures, the peptide aptamers would bind to PRPC. They cover the binding site to PRP scrapie, and this basically stops prion propagation. So recently we are now testing another possible application for the exact same molecules for the peptide aptamers that bind to PRPC. And this has to do with a possible uh, treatment option for Alzheimer's disease. So Alzheimer's disease is another neurodegenerative disease of mainly older people. And since our populations are aging more and more, it is expected that the case numbers for Alzheimer's disease will significantly rise over the next decades. Alzheimer's disease is also caused by uh, clumps of a protein in the brain. And it comes also along with the death of our brain cells. The protein that aggregates in case of Alzheimer's disease is called amyloid beta, and smaller subunits of amyloid beta called A-beta oligomers have been shown to bind to the cellular prion protein, and this binding 
signals to the brain cells that they should die. So A beta oligomers bind to PRPC and this binding results in neuronal cell death. So we are now asking whether we can use our peptide optomers that uh, bind to PRPC to interfere with the binding of the A beta oligomers and thereby stop the uh, this death of the brain cells. So ideally, if all our strategies work out, by targeting PRPC with our peptide optomers, we would end up with drugs that can be used for the treatment of both prion and Alzheimer's disease. So finally, I would like to thank all the members of my research team and our collaborators. And of course, this research wouldn't be possible without financial support. And here our gratitude goes to the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories and the Alberta Prion Research Institute, which funds our research and which was also instrumental in um, implementing a world-class prion research program here in Alberta. And thanks for your attention. So it's still, as you said, not understood exactly what happens when a normal prion is engaged by the uh, misfolded one. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you think, and you talked about the possibility of aptamers leading to some sort of treatment, but do you think the first important finding that might come out might be un a better understanding of just exactly what happens when they come together? Yeah, so actually this is another line of research we are looking at. So we try to use our peptide optomers to find those areas in, in the good, in the normal prion protein where PRP scrapey binds to. So we try to get more basic knowledge also with those molecules about the conversion process. Cool. So could I ask the previous two speakers to come up and we'll have the Q&A. Um, and again, microphones will appear magically. Oops, sorry. Thank you. And we have quite a different selection of uh, speakers of whom to ask questions. I don't understand that note. It's okay, we'll figure it out. So, um, yes, right here. So my question is on um, the foam from canola. So I, I know the story of, on ethanol production and, and corn and how that has really upset the balance of um, food production versus Manufacture using food products or potential food products in other areas, and what it, and you know if we're going to feed another two and a half billion people, and we're going to do it at reasonable cost, and we're creating these other options that are going to put a you know the stress on on the supply demand side. Uh, I you, you you didn't get into that, and I'm just kind of curious as if that's entered into the uh, calculation. Thank you. That's a, a question that comes up a lot. So my take on that is um, if you consider fuel, if you look at the amount of petroleum that's used in the world and replacing that requires, if you were to replace that with all the oil, all the vegetable oil that's produced, there wouldn't be enough even just to do that to say nothing about having food. So that doesn't seem like a great approach. But if you look at the scale of these industrial chemicals that we we want to produce. And remember currently that palm and soya already um, is used very widely for oleochemical production. We're talking about a small piece of, of the, the pie. We can look at alternative crops. It doesn't have to be canola. We're working on canola currently because that's what we have. It doesn't have to be canola. These alternative crops like camelina can come in. They can grow on more marginal land. We can use lower grade materials. There is definitely room for some percentage to be diverted towards these alternative sources. But I, I totally agree. I think you know, moving towards large-scale production of vegetable oils for fuel is a dangerous way to go. Good. Uh, over here. Uh, Dr. Uh, Uranzi, uh, concerning uh, CNC, I represent a group that does produce 
a pretty high quality CNC product called Nano Green Bio Refineries Inc. And Blue Goose, we're in your own backyard. Uh, we're doing a lot of research with other institutions such as your alma mater. Plus, I'd like to ask you a question pertaining to, we're doing a lot of work with Purdue and adding CNC to concrete. Are you doing any work in that area? Uh, not me, but uh, some of my colleagues uh, that are in the civil engineering department are doing uh, work uh, in, in adding that to concrete. Yeah, so that's, that's one, of the, one of the applications that we will be seeing down the road, I, I, think, I think, quite a bit, uh, that uh, it has quite promising results, but I'm not directly involved. Uh, Dr. Yaman Bölük, who is one of my uh, collaborators in, in the project that I uh, mentioned, is working on, on concrete uh, CNC addition to concrete. Uh, yes, up here. Hi, I just wanted to know, you're, I, I'm hearing from consumers or we're hearing sort of about the effects potentially of palm oil and the environmental impacts. Are you seeing any um, shifts or changes based on that? You mean, are we seeing shifts towards using other oils? Yes. Um, well, that's a little bit outside of my, outside of my area, but I would say that you know, yes, the, those uh, discussions are are certainly out there. We have to be careful that that uh, we produce canola and other things on the prairies in a sustainable way, as well, uh, so that we, we don't fall on in you know we don't have the similar kinds of problems. But um, certainly, there is a lot of interest in looking at alternative crops, which may be most ideally suited to the climate in which they're grown in. You know, I think that's the only way I can answer that. Uh, somebody right here? Yes. Oh. Where, yeah, you, oh, oh, sorry. Here. I've just had two comments to make regarding the first question. Um, because of the high cost of CNC, now we shift is towards CNF, which is a little larger than actually CNC. It costs less, and it's through the mechanical shearing that's produced for cement. Regarding the oil, uh, <laughs> well, and, this, and this we is my passion. And we did plant this guy, okay? This is, this is my passion. This is actually what I live for. Depending on the amount of hydroxyl groups that is going to replace petroleum-based polymers is a question that everybody would like to answer. Right now, we are using lignin, which has the uh, polyols on the side of phenolic and is a waste byproduct of many pulp and paper mills here in Alberta to try to address that very specific issues. Just to the comments, my, my yep, yep. Like I said, any conference that plays Walk on the Wild Side in intermission has the audience answering the questions. <laughs> is unique. <laughs> um, yes. Somewhere. It's just Sabine, thanks for a very interesting talk. I was just wondering, um, some of the challenges of your work are probably, um, you know, understanding the normal fu function of PRPC. So I was wondering if you have any more insights of if you use that peptide to block the interaction between the normal and the toxic protein, do you block the function of the normal protein in the brain? And also, uh, any challenges in delivering that peptide to the brain? So have you started any work with the animals? Or I don't know if you have any updates. Yeah, so actually, these are very good questions. Um, so we were concerned about whether we interfere with the function, which we do not exactly know, but it is thought that the normal prion protein has some protective effect for neurons against, against stressors and so on. So at the moment, we can only talk about our results we have in cell culture, so we do not see any toxic effects of our peptide optomeres. And since uh, mice that, that do not have the prion protein that have engineered to, to, to get rid of or to not express the prion protein do not show any strong uh, phenotypes or strong disturbances. We do not expect that we would have any uh, major influences of our peptide optomeres, but we will soon now be going into our animal models to test this. Um, to your second question, yes, it is a challenge. So uh, to deliver those substances into the brain is not so easy, and we are thinking on the one hand about pack packaging the proteins into lipid vesicles and targeting them to the brain by this way, or to use computational models to, to find small chemicals that mimic the binding of the peptide optomeres to PRPC. 
and thereby maybe find a drug or tailor a drug that can go into the brain and, and be used for treatment of those diseases. Yeah, it's indicative of the breadth of challenges in uh, prion research because you can be dealing in the lab like that and you can look at chronic wasting disease and ask the question, how can we possibly contain it when a deer might move 100 kilometers and might be shedding prions all the way? So, you know, it's multi-level, as are all these topics. Uh, way at the top. Another uh, prion question. So I was wondering if the PRPC is the same prion, or if it's the same protein across all of the different prion diseases, and then if the function of the non-pathological version of the prion protein is known. Um, sorry, can, can you say it again, please? So if PRPC, is that the same protein across the different species and across the different uh, prion diseases? Mm -hmm. Um, and then if the normal function of PRPC is known, what, it's normal, what it normally does in a cell. So what, what is known about the function of the, pre, of the normal prion protein? The normal prion protein. Yeah, so um, the main function is that it is involved in, in transporting copper ions across the, the membrane of neurons. So it, it um, mediates copper import into brain cells. And the other function is probably that it protects neurons uh, from, from stress. And stress can be like, if you think about uh, persons that have a stroke, this has been tested in mice, so, so stroke has been induced in mouse models. And it was shown that mice that, ex that have the normal prion protein, that the brain areas that are damaged are smaller than uh, the brain areas in mice that do not have the prion protein. So we think that the prion protein is kind of neuroprotective and, and protects brain cells. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Sometimes I forget to do things at the right time. Uh, what I would like to ask is if the previous speakers could stand up at least and uh, would, uh, there's lots of time, there's going to be a reception afterwards, so if you have further questions, you can certainly direct them to them. Uh, but I'm supposed to acknowledge their uh, presentations with a gift for each. So maybe we could applaud them while I, and that will cover up the fact that I should have done this earlier. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And And uh, thank you very much, as usual, uh, an attentive, informed and audience with great questions. We really appreciate that, too. Thank you very much.